Video? Okay. So yeah, I'm happy to introduce Jeff. So Jeff and I were in the same cohort. We started here as master students together. And he's always been a tremendous uh, instructional designer and teacher. He was a principal for a while and uh, worked in the schools. And now he, then he got hired um, after he graduated to be over in the technology and engineering education department. And he's doing great things there. He's been part of the core that developed the innovation boot camp that is being tremendously popular over there. And um, many other places on campus are trying to adopt it. And they've been very open with their curriculum, which we appreciate. They've allowed other people to teach boot camps and things like that. And, and so he's done some tremendous work over there and is really a great designer and thinker. And if I need someone on my design team, Jeff would be one of the first people I would, I would pick to come. And if I needed someone on my running cross-country team, he would also be <laughs> one of the first people, as long as he didn't make me run with him, because he's a little too fast for me. <laughs> so we're excited to have Jeff here with us. All right. All right. Yeah. All right, it's great to be here. It's kind of like coming back. Uh, it's interesting how it's kind of, there's a spectrum of, of uh, wisdom moving forward, except you're a little out of place <laughs> in the like, age. So, um, Let's see here. This is not mirroring correctly. Let's try this again. Is this the color we get? Sometimes it takes a little while. <laughs> sometimes it just is that way. Sometimes always. it just stays that color. All right, well, I guess it doesn't matter. We'll see. It's retro. <laughs> it's retro. <laughs> it's kind of like that smile. Oh. oh, good. It's still there. I remember. I was in Charles's class and someone drew on this. <laughs> I remember that, that was great. <clears throat> okay, so Innovation 101. I'm taking a, a 10 hour course and giving it to you in 45 minutes, probably 40 minutes. So it's gonna be fast, it's gonna be... Uh, awesome. Awesome, here we go. Innovation, why is it important? Maybe we can catch one of the lights up here, maybe that'll help, I don't know. Maybe not, I don't know. Okay, so why is it important? Just a little bit of background to build some ethos up here. One, it's known as uh, the currency of modern day industry. So innovation is important. What's interesting is there's been a lot of researchers you can read that say innovation is considered the most important component of a company's success and their top priority. What I think is interesting is now on resumes, so if you go to resume scanner, and look up the keywords, this is what they're looking for, the number one word. And of course it'll change, it's maybe trendy right now. But what I find interesting is it's not just the number one competency that employees here in the United States are looking for, but it's all over the world. Everyone is claiming this. In fact, if you read the EU Chamber of Commerce report, they said the central aim of the EU 2020 strategy put Europe's economy onto a high and sustainable growth path, and how are they gonna do it? Through innovative potential. Then if you look around, India, who you would think, you know, maybe they're just good at making widgets and so forth. This is their claim too. Federal Bureau of Business and Economics of India. In the ever-changing world, innovation is the key for them. So everyone's saying it, but the question is, how do you do it? So there was a, a report that came out and the College of Engineering, which I'm part of, they moved the College of Engineering ranking to 16th in the nation. That was a big jump for us. And they only cited one thing. And they cited that we're teaching innovation. That was the only thing they cited. Out of all the great research and the things that are way more important, they said, well, they guys, these guys are making everyone take a class on innovation. So that was kind of exciting, kind of interesting. But so how do you do it? How do you uh, think innovatively? Here's some facts. Fact number one, a lot of people think they are or cannot be innovative. Like this little duck, it's so cute, trying to get out of there. It can, it can get out of there with its beak. So the idea of this uh, curriculum that we've developed is making innovation seem possible. And that's really important for, especially our college, where you have these traditional engineering students who might not always think that they can. So here's your case study. Tell me if this is true or false. And I know a true and false test is a good thing Brother Sudwicks is in here, because he told me never to take a true and false test. Is he in here? He's not in here. Okay, so creativity is largely a genetic endowment where nature trumps nurture and importance. True or false? True. True, okay. Some people say true. False. 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 It's a false dichotomy. Okay, so let's look at this. <laughs> so is it genetic? Well, if you're like most people, 80% of the people answer this incorrectly. And here's your little case study, or your research study. You have these twins, they're raised apart. 
And sometime between the ages of 15 and 25, the twins are given intelligence and creativity tests. So we got the Torrance test of creativity, Rick. Here we go. Results. IQ tests show that 80% is uh, genetic. In contrast, creativity is only 33%. So we have potential. Some of us have potential. Some of you. <laughs> okay, so it's not just genetic. What we learn is it's not just genetic for most. It can be taught, it can be learned, it can be practiced, it can be implemented. So I'm going to kind of speed up here and just give you a little bit of background. This is the model that we subscribe to. It gets at this idea of divergence, which is your top, all these creative sparks that happen, and convergence. Creativity or implementation, or you can think about it as divergent thinking and convergent thinking. But it's the combination of both that makes innovation. Are you innovative? Well, I have some divergent ideas, but I also can converge. Therefore, you would think that you're innovative. So this is the model that our curriculum comes out of. The principles of the, the curriculum, it's creativity focus, which is divergent thinking, people-centered, people-centric, which is different than the 80s when things weren't, no one cared about people. Three, it's collaborative and it's guided by methods. I'm gonna spend most of the time on talking about the methods and tools, because that's what's interesting in the curriculum probably for you. Uh, so, the first one is creativity focus. The curriculum really just deals with divergent thinking, so I'll get, come back to that in a second. Two, people-centered. We use this, this lady as an anecdote. If you know her story, I don't know how many know this story. If you don't, it's this uh, student from the School of Visual Arts, and her grandmother accidentally took her grandfather's pills. Why? Because all the pills look like this. And they have a hard time with their their hands reading, and they all look the same. So what did she come up with? She came up with a people solution, where she flattened out the bottle so you can read the, the instructions, then she color-coded it so you know which days you could take the medicine so it's quicker and so forth. Third principle, collaborative. So in our college, we have construction management, facility management, IT, ID, TE, civil engineering. Now we've, uh, not in our college, but now business kids are all taking the, the boot camp too, or a lot of them, the entrepreneurship kids and so forth. So what's interesting there is it gets at this principle that the strength of a solution comes in the diversity of the people involved. Now the fourth part is the methods and tools, and this is what we're going to talk about mostly. We call it users. Understand, shape, explore, refine, share. These are not, it's not a process, but we call them the ingredients of innovation or the methods and tools of innovation that'll help you think divergently. So I'm gonna go through each one really quick and this is where you guys will come into uh, focus with your yogurt. So they shouldn't be open. Rick, is yours closed? It's closed. Okay, it's not Greek. Some of you I know are like, it's not Greek yogurt, I can't <laughs> eat it. Okay, so first principle. Understand, so this is the propensity to intensely observe the world around you, such as customers, products, services, companies, and technology. So someone that's really good at observing, you can think of this as an opportunity to find problems. And so there's a couple techniques to observe, experience, and inquire. I'm gonna talk about them really quickly. The first one, here's your anecdote. I don't know if you know who this Joseph Friedman is. Really interesting guy. He's sitting in, um, one of those uh, places, what do they call it? Ice cream parlor with his daughter and they're at a bench and the daughter keeps tipping her milkshake and spilling on herself. And he's getting frustrated, another 10 cents for the ice cream and he's, he doesn't want to get mad at his daughter. So what does he do? Take out the straw, puts in a screw, wraps some dental floss around the screw or a piece of string, pulls out the screw, the world's first bendable straw. So, he made an observation, right? So he could see something happening and then he came up, because he identified a problem, he could solve it, right? So observing, there's ways to do this. One problem is that we're conditioned to see things how we're used to. That's one major problem certainly at BYU because we're very homogenous, right? We all observe, we have similar backgrounds. And so we, we have these filters, our filter is similar here, of occupation, clothes, age, gender, religion, and so forth. But we need to see things with a fresh pair of eyes. And I like this one, Doug Dietz. And so he's uh, one of the designers for uh, GM and the CAT scan. If you've ever had a CAT scan, you know how scary and dark and cold they can be. I remember when I had one, they tell you you have to lie still for 20 minutes. You cannot move. They have straps, which would be great, but if you're a child, that would be terrible. So a dark hole, they're sliding you into, you're waving by, and you might be strapped down. <laughs> and they can't put you out because the chemicals would change 
the scan, right? And so he's over at the Boston Museum of Science hanging out. He's, he's like, kids love museums now. And he's looking around and the museums have all this fun stuff. So he said, well, we're going to make the CAT scan a Buzz Lightyear adventure. A great observation. He paired two things. So what we do in our class is we have students go around campus looking for adaptive behaviors. Now, adaptive behaviors are things that compensate for the lack of design. Even in this room, if you looked around, there's probably plenty of adaptive behaviors. We can look in a second. But it's when we alter the purpose of context of things to meet our objectives. <coughs> so here's some that we, are, we constantly see. Students go around, they see this adaptive behavior, something catching the, the leftover when you pump and there's extra soap coming down, or you don't want, you know, maybe this is your guys' printer, I don't know. That's where all the money went to, the cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> this here, you know, uh, I grew up putting tinfoil on this, so you see this one. The, the one you mostly see on camp, campus is this adaptive behavior, a bike seat covered with, you know, uh, plastic bag. So going around and looking for adaptive behaviors is a great way to problem find, because you're seeing opportunities for innovation. You're seeing things that are really troublesome, a lack of design. And it, it, I'm going to warn you, it's a drug. As soon as you start doing it, you won't stop. And then when you're talking about it and noticing in the car with your wife, your wife will get mad and, and, and <laughs> tell you to be quiet. So be careful. Another way to, you can call these things are pain points or bug lists. You can wake up in the morning and just start writing down the things that bug you. Or things that are difficult when you're doing something at work or you're exercising. You write down things that bug you or things that are painful. These all give you opportunities. They're good observation techniques. The other technique, and this is where we start with the yogurt, so I want you to try. There's a French expression, déjà vu. Everyone knows what that means. Peter, déjà vu. I've seen it. You've already seen it. Okay, good. But if you invert the word, we just made this up. It's not true. <laughs> um, we, want, we want it to mean like you've never seen it. So this is what I want to do. We're going to do 30 second exercises. The class, we'd spend more time, we, and I don't use the yoga one in class. It's just for you. This is special. Um, <laughs> you got 30 seconds. You're going to try and experience opening your yogurt as if you've never opened yogurt before. So pretend you've never done it. Look at it, inspect it, think about it, upside down, sideways. How do I open this thing? You have 30 seconds to do some vujade. Experience something like you've never done before. I'm going to time to keep us honest. Ready? 30 seconds, go. Make observations from Vuja Deng. So we should open it the way we would if we didn't know what was going to happen. Right. And if you've never opened one, congratulations. This is authentic. <laughs> really authentic. 30 seconds. Go ahead, open them up. Okay. I would assume. Yeah. I don't know what I would assume. Yeah. We're getting down to ten seconds. So uh, focus your vujading a little bit quicker. I would put my. This is what I would do. In here. In fact, I've done this for many times. Okay. Stop for a second. I know it's quick. We don't have time to really get into this. But the idea is, as you do a vujade experience you should make some new observations. So we do it with brushing the teeth or eating french fries. We do this experience in lots of different ways. The yoga works, and I'll show you here in a second. So you should have made some observations while you're opening it. When you open it, this is what happens to me every time, because I eat yoga every day, open it, it explodes. They put some kind of dynamite in there. I don't know how it works. Fruit cups. Yeah, fruit cups, right? Same thing. There's an observation, one that, or the, the lid rips. Any other quick observations someone made? I would have tried to open it this way because everything else in my experience is shaped like that. Not like so that. the other, so it's upside down to you. Okay, so good, good, good observations. So that's it annoys me how much <coughs> yogurt is left on the lid. I always feel like I'm losing out. You lick it off. I, I do. lick it. I lick it out. So there's an observation. Rick is a, likes to lick yogurt. <laughs> Write that down. Okay, so inquiry. After we observe, we experience by opening yogurt with vujade. We ask questions. Ask why, even if you think you know the answer. Why did I open it this way? Why did the lid rip? Encourage stories. Turn to your partner and you say, well, tell me your stories with eating yogurt. So I did this with my kids. Daughter's next to me. We do um, Yople or Greek now. And um, she, she likes animals. So when I give her a big yogurt, she's like, Dad, I need a straw. I was like, OK. Get her a straw. And she just punches it through the top and starts sucking it. I'm like, 
my child's brilliant. <laughs> so there's my story I just told you. Look for inconsistencies. Sometimes what people say and do are different, so you want to observe. So this is good, like if you've taken uh, Dave Williams' class on qualitative uh, inquiry and so forth. Don't be afraid of silence. Force them to talk to you. Don't suggest answers. <coughs> and be neutral. So uh, there we go. There's a story. I like this. Network. This is an important after in doing inquiry. You have this story. Um, this is uh, Mark Benioff. He's the founder of Salesforce. And he hangs out with Drew Houston, the founder of Dropbox. Why? Because he wants to hang out with people who are not like him. And we'll do an activity on that right now. What I want you to do in 60 seconds, write this down, or think about it in your head if you need to. List your top 10 go-to people for helping you generate new ideas. So think of 10 people in your head. I'm going to pick on someone. So you got, uh, instead of 60 seconds, you got 10 seconds. <laughs> One second per name. Go ahead. Who are some people you'd go to? Brian, who would you go to? My first people would probably be my family. And then uh, colleagues at work. OK. And probably people at school, professors, or. OK, so let's stop you right there. Is that good or bad, those group of people you're going to? Under this condition, bad. Right. They're all similar. My family has a similar background as me. People at work are facing similar situations as I am. Exactly. So that highlights this principle. But raise the hands, how many people have the same company, same industry, same profession, same gender? So right now you should be scratching on people on your list. Be like, okay. Same age. So everybody on your list is scratched off. That's good. I'm glad you said that. Same ethnic group. This is the problem with BYU and creativity is we're all very similar, right? Same kind of culture we're coming from. And that is not that helpful. In fact, there's a great book, Never Eat Lunch Alone. You've heard of that book? Yeah, it's a great book because it's the idea of promoting eating and talking and mostly eating with people that you don't even know and <coughs> hanging out with people you don't know. Okay, so after you do understanding, observing, experience, inquiry, vuja day, adaptive behaviors, you move on to shaping your observations. So you have all these observations. Maybe you've written them down or whatever. You need to organize those ideas, simplify and clarify those ideas. The goal of this is to create a problem statement. Once you have a problem statement, you can have a solution. And Einstein said the exact same thing. Formation of a problem is often more important than a solution. Or additionally, a problem well stated is half solved. So you can have all these observations, but you need to be able to do something with it. So you need a problem statement. Here's your anecdote to remember this. If you know who uh, Silver Spencer is, don't reveal it. It's a great story. Because what he wanted to do is create a glue that would be strong like super glue, but that would not quickly adhere so that people could use it over and over again. And so these are his problem statements that he might have come up with. How can we make the glue stronger? Is it important for glue to be strong? Can a glue that's not strong be useful? What's a good use for glue that's weak? Who is he hanging out with? Art Fry, choir boy, his buddy. Art Fry is in the choir. This is back in the day. You'd actually have a choir book. And you'd put pieces of paper called bookmarks, if you've ever heard of that, in this book. He'd sing, and when he'd open it up, the bookmarks would fall out, and he wouldn't know what page to get to. Bingo. What does he do? That's where sticky note came from. So, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I guess. <laughs> so much for super glue. So how do you, this is what I, these are my questions for you. How do you make yogurt that you can eat with a spoon, that you can eat without a spoon? Or how do you stop the lid from ripping and popping. So you have these observations. Rick's observation was he always licks the top. Not enough is in the thing. What would your problem statement be, Rick? How to, how to help the user be able to get all of their yogurt out. Nice one. So then, because we have a problem statement, we can start trying to solve something. We just took that observation, we gave it a problem statement, and now we can move towards solving it. That's great. So after you have a problem statement, this is the fun part. You get to questioning, well, I think observing is fun too, comparing, comparing and combining. The point of this one 
is aimed at discovering potential solution by means of branching out, making unexpected associations, applying the known in unusual ways, and seeing unexpected implications. It's a lot of words, but it really gets at this. What and why and what if? Good questions. So you want to challenge the status quo by asking what? What's the point of this? Or why do we do it like this? Or what if we did it this way? And it helps you gain a new understanding. Our activity that we do is something called question storming. And so instead of brainstorming solutions, we just make them write down question after question after question. The more questions you have, the more potential for solutions. So we have them write down uh, brainstorming only questions to the problem, why, what if, and so forth. And so what I want you to do right now, we'll take a couple, 30 seconds. Let's ask some what and why questions. What, what is the purpose of these indents? Why does this have all this useless space underneath, right? Why is it this shape instead of you? You said it should be the other way. So let's get a couple why and what if. Don't use this one. Why do we need a spoon? Not when we hear every time. I've only done this one other time, so I've heard it. So come up, try and get a new one. So come up with a why and what if question. So everybody think of it, turn to your partner, share your why and what if. Why does it go down and then go up in this box? Good. Why? What could you use that space for? If they have to do that for injection molding, what could they use that space for? What if it was made out of a different material? Mm. Okay, let's come together real quick. We'll go to this table. They had a good question I heard. They had the yogurts. And she's like, well, why does it have like the double step? And so then you're like, well, maybe some kind of injection molding they use for this. But maybe the question is, what could I use this space for, right? And so I heard one time, the last time, the only other time we've done this, is they're like, well, why don't, because once she has a good problem observation, a problem statement, and a good question, they said, what if I did a spoon under here that's attached to the side and you can just break it off? I was like, hey, that's simple. That doesn't change the injection molding. It just has a little die. It may be really simple to do. It's a great idea. So you're off your questions, you should come up with some potential ideas. They should just start sparking. What was another question that we had up here? Why is it a tinfoil top? Why a tinfoil top? Some yogurts have paper tops. Why tinfoil? What if the tinfoil didn't rip? Whoa, what if it was resealable? Because if you have kids, they never finish a yogurt. <laughs> And you can't eat that yogurt again because you put it in the fridge and it like gets all hard on top and it's gross, right? What if they made the top double as a spoon? What if the... So like, they put some stronger pieces in it so you can just fold it in and it would become a Twist it off and it's got a spoon on the inside and then you can just start spooning it out. Why don't they do that? What if they did? Life would be so much easier. Why not have a screwable, screwable top, right? Then you take, take away the popping and take away the... See, the screwable top, that's good. No more popping. Look at all these things that are happening and it's yogurt, this is great. Okay, so I know you're excited about your idea, but we're moving on. <laughs> okay, so the next one I really like is comparing and combining. It's the ability to make combinations of previously unrelated structures in such a way that you get more out of the emergent hole than the parts that you put in. Steve Jobs said this best and represents this best in just a second. Creativity is connecting things, cre uh, creative people connect experiences they've had and synthesize new ideas. So he did this. Now some of you might not have been born when this next slide came out, but I know some of us were, because I remember having this iPod. I still have it. You still have it, okay, I'm s that's good. Congratulations, that's great. Um, look at where this came from. He used the idea that you grew up with, a master lock on your combination in high school or junior high or whatever, everyone knew how to do that. And so he used an intuitive, well not intuitive, something you're used to from experience and growing up, and he put it to another use. He repurposed it, so we know how to use it. He also probably, this, this probably also came out of a lot of this user understanding. They understood that people would want to manipulate with one hand. Mm. If you're holding in your hand, how many digits do you have available to you? you yeah, great. You know, now phones get so big, which can be a whole other debate, <laughs> that it's no longer a one-handed input. 
And that yeah. was, I think what one other thing that they were trying to go for is, is people with their music probably want just a one-handed input. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Rick. Perfect, perfect thing to share. <laughs> that would be the next step. <laughs> yeah, that's coming. Okay, so here's some other associations I thought were interesting. I love this in, uh, industrial designer. You're repurposing two liter bottles, what for? Suit jackets, that's a great idea because your suit jackets, you don't want them to be skinny. You, know, you want them big and puffy, I guess. If you have, you know, big arms. Yeah, show your big arms. <laughs> you know, you saw this again, where um, bike brushes over here, they had this combination, clean out your bike chain, your chain rings, you know, with the brush and with the cleaner. So you can see brushes have been repurposed uh, multiple times. Okay. This is how we make our students do it. We make them do forced association. And uh, this is a great technique. And you guys are going to try it right now. I'm going to pop up a slide with a bunch of random words. You have to use the word to solve your yogurt problem. So here are the words. Associative thinking. Use the list above. Choose one or three. Swimmer. How would a swimmer, what does a swimmer use, do, act like, or train with that could solve this? Rain boots. Sunroof. <coughs> For yogurts, you force the association. I'll give you one example to get you going. There is, um, I thought there was a car or a mechanic. Oh, windshield, that's where it came from. Someone said, well, why doesn't it have a windshield wiper on the inside that's kind of like a spatula that you can pull it out, right? Just kind of, like trough, it just feeds you. <laughs> That'd be great. Okay, so here you go. Force association, choose one of the words. We don't have time, just choose one and force a solution where you're combining two ideas to solve your problem. All right, I'm going to go after an old guy this time. So let's see if the old guys can get some sparks. 30 seconds. Here we go. It doesn't have to be clever, it can be by yourself. And the car seat has like a removable, um, you like Velcro that thing on, right? So if you take it off, you like, you know, so maybe you have a, so it's like a, yeah, you can just have it out, yeah. That's good. I want to change the finger at the other way. Yeah. I think you want to put that in effect on the pressure that's in there. All right, let's, let's come back together here. Let's see what kind of idea we have. Let's, let's go to the, let's go to, oh, did you just say the push pop idea? Yeah, that's good. I've heard that one one other time. <laughs> that's good. So you're kind of original, 50% original. I was going to say you're what other time. So 50%. Let's go to uh, Dr. Gibbons. Let's, let's go. Let's, did you have any good combinations back there? Combinations between those. Something up there to solve your yogurt problem. It's, it's fun to pick on a professor that you had because you're like, okay, were you listening? <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Good. Good. One of the things that uh, one of the things that I observed was that the impression is probably so that they'll stack hmm. on the grocery shelves. That's good for the grocer. These marks here are probably for manufacturing purposes, so that this little cup here can be handled by some kind of a machine. And so when you design something, you're designing for a whole bunch of different purposes. For the person that has to manufacture the thing, for the person that has to sell, for the person that has to distribute. Uh, storage became a factor. How long can you store it before it and, uh, and so the little explosive lid, that that was probably the least of their concerns. <laughs> Cost is a very, very big factor. And so I'd say that what you're looking at is is, is like, you know how a, a raindrop forms itself into a sphere because that's the most economical shape? I would imagine that, that after a lot of different designs were proposed, this was the most economical shape for a whole bunch of users and purposes. Okay, those are that's great. I like I like all the observations. It's, it's, it's really helpful because then you can get to your problem statement and some ideas to combine. Peter, did you have a combined idea? Uh, yeah, we went with the car seat. So um, yeah. we realized uh, 
Christina uh, pointed out that you can uh, take off a cover on a car seat. So we thought maybe if I had like a liner, like a trash can and a car seat type of thing. So you could eat it all and then when you're done, you take it out and put it on here and just lift the edge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get every little okay, yeah. I can oddly. Yeah. There might also be some extra uh, Cheerios at the bottom. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that idea and I hope never to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I forgot. One of the rules is defer judgment. Right. I forgot. <laughs> defer judgment. I'm broken. I'm never going to do this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so another thing that we like doing, and this is really helpful. So after you do some combinations, maybe you get stuck at some of your combinations. What do you do? Attribute listing. You take the thing that you're working on, like Dr. Gibbons did right there. He took the yogurt, he broke it down. He said he's got these indents, it's made of this, and you break it down. So even with this screwdriver, we have a transition area, a shaft, a handle, okay, what's the function of the handle, ergonomics, it's made out of plastic, steel, aluminum, and you write down as many words, nouns, adjectives, verbs, it doesn't really matter, that will define that thing that you're working on. And it's not just for products, it could be for systems or services, but you need to break down all the words, because then you could start combining or solving problems for that one. Here's an example, because once you have the words, you can go to scamper. This is another activity, it's not unique to us, a lot of people use scamper. It's the idea of substituting, combining, adapting, magnifying or minifying, putting to another use, eliminating or reversing or rearranging. So if you look at the screwdriver, this is what happened to the screwdriver. Substitute? Yes, we've all seen this. We've all seen this, take off the top, you have all these different heads you can put in and so forth. Look at that, that's putting to another use, putting the handle to another use. So as soon as you have all the vocabulary, you can start Rearranging, magnifying, minifying, minifying, is that even a word? Minimizing. Minimizing. <laughs> it's amazing what happens when you start presenting, like your vocabulary and your speaking ability. Remember, maybe it's just me. It's probably just me. Okay, so scampering is a great technique. Going back to that bike problem, the bike seat with the, with the plastic covering. One of the industrial design students, they submitted this when they were working on this problem in class. Great sketches, but they get at this idea. They, they, they use the, the car and the mechanic. They're like, okay, well, I got a window shade. I pull that to Brock uh, Sun. Why don't I have it on the back of my bike and I just pull it over my seat and then when I'm done, I put it back. Great idea, right? They repurposed an idea. They kind of mini minimized it, made it smaller and put it to another use. You got some other funny ones on there. Something that sheds, seat heater, seat diaper, a flip up seat, so forth. <laughs> okay, so after we explore, we're questioning, we're comparing, we're combining, then we need to get to our visualization stage where we start iterating and validating some of these ideas. Because you have all these crazy ideas. Peter's idea was good, it wasn't bad. But maybe once we try it out, we realize it's not the best. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. And so we need to visualize, and you do that through iterations, and then you need to validate. This is a great quote. David Kelly, founder of IDEO. If a picture is worth a thousand words, a prototype is worth one million or more words. And so you need to do that. So we go through refining. And the idea is you want a strong visual manifestation. And we get to this story. I don't know if you've heard this story before. But uh, so basically the story goes, teacher of a pottery class, he um, divides the class in half. You guys on this half, you're going to research. Do research. You're grad students. You guys research how to make the best pot. Or vase would be a better word there. Make a, make a good vase. You guys are just going to have as much clay as you want and you turn vases after vases after vases. At the end of the semester, you make your final vase, you guys just make your one because you researched it. We're going to see who makes the best vase. Which group made the best vase? Yeah, the guys that were able to iterate and iterate and iterate. Obviously there's a time where this is not helpful, but again, we're talking about divergent thinking. We're at this, the top of the ice cream model. We're not at convergence where that would be expensive to do, right? We're at divergent thinking. And so yeah, the more iterations, the better. After you do that, what do you do? You probably talk about this in your classes, you do a SWOT analysis. What are some strengths and weaknesses, some opportunities and threats of the new product, system, or service that you've come up with? After you've done your iterations, this is helping you do some validation. 
is this really worth my time? Is this too expensive? Maybe we go back to that manufacturing process and say, okay, well, this is most efficient. So you do a SWOT analysis. And then the last thing that you do is you get to share. And this is great for us in our college because we don't, the engineers are not traditionally your best sharing people that get you excited to buy the product. And so it's been nice to have some of the business kids come in and, and be like the stage presence. And what we tell them is they have to be able to show it, demonstrate it, and describe it. They're pretty good at describing. They can throw up a PowerPoint and have some nice CAD mock-ups, but they're not really good at showing and describing. And so we have them go through an acting scenario where they have to act with their product. And it's been really good, because as soon as you try and use what Peter was describing with the baggie on the inside, he's going to pull out and lick. And he's, you can imagine Peter up in class licking this thing. <laughs> uh, you might be like, that's awkward. I'm not going to buy that. <laughs> and it's a great, but acting helps, because a lot of times it sounds good up here, but until you try and use it, you don't realize that there are, could be some issues. So we, um, okay, here's a quote. A man who cannot communicate his ideas the same as one who doesn't have one or have any. In fact, I know this is true. Just recently, I was in Seattle with uh, a buddy who's an uh, industrial designer. He's, in work, he's working with an electrical engineer. And what he's been doing with the electrical engineer is taking all his ideas. <laughs> That's what he does. He hired this electrical engineer because he was talking to him at church one day, of all places. And this guy, he's like, man, he's brilliant. He has all these great ideas, but he doesn't know how to get them out the door. And so we hired him, brought him in, and it, it has repurposed, rejuvenated my buddy's company because now he's, he has these two new things that are killing on the market. We're going to come out here pretty soon, this other one. And he just, this engineer had all these ideas. He couldn't communicate it. So what we do is we teach him this. We have them share their story, show, demonstrate, and describe using this acronym. Their idea has to be simple. They have to kind of preach something that's unexpected, catch them off guard, concrete, credible, emotional, tell them to tell a story, and so forth. There is a competition in Utah called the Invented in Utah Competition. Anybody know about it? Peter, do you know about this one? Rick? Held in Boulder over here? No. No. So is that what that is? Okay. No. Okay. Invented in Utah. This is a great one. I don't know if you guys know these guys. Do you guys know these BYU grads, Climate? Some of you, Brian knows them. So this is great. So I'm sitting at Inventing in Utah as one of the judges, and these guys come in. And their story is so great. This is how they tell their story. They did it better, but I'll do it really quick. Basically, they said, have you ever been skiing and been too cold? Yeah, of course I have. How about, have you ever gotten warmer later in the day and then thought, what am I going to do with all these layers? I was like, yeah, I, I've done that. I took off my jacket, left it at the lift, hoping it would be there at the end of the day. It wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't, yeah. <laughs> and so I've had that experience. And so they tell this story, and they said, yeah, we did too. So that was their problem statement. Their problem statement was, sometimes you're too hot, sometimes you're too cold skiing. What do you do? So then this one kid, one of the kids of the company, the two starters, he goes scuba diving. And while he's scuba diving, he realizes that he's neither hot nor cold. He's perfect temperature because on his scuba set, he has some kind of gas he can release into the suit called argon. And so what they did is they stole that idea from scuba diving and they put that with their ski jacket problem. And what they did is this jacket has a little argon capsule and basically a temperature gauge. If it's cold, release a little more argon into the seal. Of course, it's sealed, right? You're not going to get sick or anything. Jacket. And then uh, release it. So it's working pretty good. And then they come back to the competition, and they do this. And what, what did they sell the new story? They say, have you ever been camping and had a, a, a thermal rest or something that is, you know, is not warm? Like, we've put the argon in that. And they said, in addition, what we did is we did a sleep study. We found that your body or your kid's body, a short one, never touches these areas. And so they said, we used Scamper and eliminated those parts so that this thing gets this small and it's a backpacker's dream. It's warm because you can adjust the temperature and it's super lightweight because it's this small. It's great, right? They use combining, they use scampering, associative thinking, and they could tell a story. So did they win? They didn't. But they did good. They did good. So, in short, because we, we went really quick, this method and tools for divergent thinking, 
seems to be working with our students and it seems to kind of fit what research has said about innovation and creativity. That as you understand our problem, do some experiences, some inquiry and networking, you're gonna have some ideas. You're gonna do some problem finding. You're gonna be able to shape some of those ideas. You can do some comparing, comparing and combining that will lead you to validating through some iterations and then you'll be able to share your idea. And that's kind of what the curriculum entails. It's kind of a 40 minute version of a, a block class, but I uh, appreciate your time. If you have questions about it, maybe we have time, I don't know. We maybe have time for one question, if there are any. What? Maybe can you just give us, I know you guys have gone through various iterations of the boot camp. You've done the one week thing, you've done like a whole semester, you've done a month, you've done different kinds of things. What do you think is the greatest bang for your buck as far as time goes? Like how long does it take someone to get enough of an understanding of this process to be able to apply it? I think, um, so we are trying to give it to our freshman and sophomore students. And then in each of our classes, we kind of come back to some of the principles and some of the activities. So you get to reuse some of the ideas. Yeah, but the idea is if we give it all at one time, so we've gone back to the one day model with the follow up evening where they share their idea, it's been great because it's a boot camp. It gets them excited, it gets them immersed in it, and then we can draw upon that the rest of the semester. <laughs> so the idea is you gotta break down some of the barriers and give them a few techniques. Everyone can observe and make bug lists. Everyone experiences things so if they can start leveraging those experiences, those observations, by saying, well, I wonder how a mechanic would solve this, I think it helps. So I, for us, the model right now fits our curriculum um, within the college because of credit load and because it's getting to the freshmen and we can scaffold on it, you know? Is there a one-day boot camp that we could come to? So yeah, um, there's eight sections of it right now, and the eighth section is open campus-wide. So if you want to take the eight section, um, yeah, you can sign up. Anybody can take it. I should also mention the classes about divergent thinking. We have a second class is starting this spring on convergent thinking because what's been happening is a lot of people come out with these ideas and they're like, well, what do I do now? And so now we've added the second class and that starts this spring. And in, uh, so the first class is called Tech 312. The second class is Tech 313. And yeah, it's open. Anybody on campus can take these classes but they do fill up really quick, especially now that the beast, the business school has been invited. <laughs> the beast. <laughs> All right, I mean. let's give Jeff a hand. Thank you for coming. You're welcome to come down to Soup Kitchen and All right, let thanks. people ask you informally questions. Thanks, Charles. Thank you. Thank you.